My name is Shannon Jackson. I'm Associate Vice Chancellor for the Arts and Design here at Berkeley, in addition to being a professor in theater and in rhetoric. Um, and it is my privilege to welcome you here to a new semester, uh, to a new decade, um, and also to the first public program of the semester sponsored by my office, Berkeley Arts Plus Design. The Arts Plus Design initiative was created on campus as essentially glue function to join in collaboration um, a range of creative departments, so-called creative departments across music, art practice, art history, uh, film, new media, design, architecture, landscape architecture, uh, as well as to think about relationships amongst the academic departments and um, organizations like this, our Campus Museum, Cal Performances, and a, a variety of creative centers, institutes, presenting organizations, and some 100 or so student clubs. So everything that we do is done in collaboration with multiple faculty, multiple students, multiple organizational entities on campus in order to elevate and fortify uh, the creative impulses here at Berkeley and to join them with the public mission of our research university. So this program, A plus D Thursdays, is one of a few that we do. I want to also flag a few others that are upcoming. We'll be launching A plus D Mondays again for the spring semester starting next Monday at 6.30. We hope to welcome you there. Uh, we, I also want to flag that we have coming up really quickly a Creative Careers Fest that's going to be held here at BAM PFA, followed by a talk by Drew Bennett, founder of the um, Facebook Artist in Residency program, um, with many different nonprofit um, and industry leaders in varieties of creative fields here to talk to students um, all throughout. Um, any more information you'd like to have about that, let us know. Another thing our office does is sponsor the Arts Passport, something that you can find on your phone, students, and log in and claim tickets and subsidized experiences to arts events all throughout campus and all throughout the Bay Area, whether it's Cal Performances, BAM PFA here, or places like SF MoMA, the Legion of Honor, um, Berkeley Repertory Theater, and more. That's another element of what we try to do to make sure that students have uh, as direct access to the arts as possible. This particular series, A Plus D Thursdays, some of you may know, sits inside of a public course, Letters and Sciences 25, or Thinking Across the Arts and Design at Berkeley. It's a course that was created by myself and another colleague a few years ago to introduce students to a range of creative forms across music, literature, film, visual art, um, and all kinds of performance forms and more. Um, and also to make sure that they had access to venues on campus and venues in our region. Um, uh, and as you now know, it also opens once a week to the public with an incredible lecture series um, that we're launching today. So as somebody who has taught this course a few times and has then also seen others take over the reins, it is um, always a privilege to see how people take up um, and make something special of this course, how students and community members connect through the arts in this course, and how they start to make varieties of creative forms relevant to their daily lives or um, uh, increasing, um, increasing the relevance um, that might have already begun for them. Past courses have had different themes, themes like architecture of life, California countercultures, migration and transformation, curation across disciplines, and as I hope you saw from online announcements, this semester's theme is on public art and belonging. It's a theme <clears throat> that is a, pre a precious and pivotal um, pre precious and pivotal theme for us on this campus right now. Over the last year or more, a coalition of students, faculty, and staff have been working together to address um, directly issues of race, blackness, diversity, um, and yes, belonging on our campus. The coalition has challenged our chancellor and campus administration in, uh, to address directly the conditions of belonging of, for, here on campus for students of color and specifically for African-American students. Within that challenge, the coalition has made an incredible request for more public art on campus that addresses issues of race and diversity. Um, 
It's a request that I think knows the power of the arts to um, propel community, to provoke discussion, and to reimagine the conditions of belonging. And so we're incredibly pleased that thanks to uh, the support of several um, donors, um, some of whom are in this room, we have been able to offer this course again, this public lecture series again, and very specifically to make it into a weekly vehicle for advancing this uh, important campus work around creativity and diversity on our, um, on our campus. So in seeking uh, to use this course in this way, we had to set about finding faculty who could lead this course. Um, and it's a hard course to lead in many ways. It has thematic, um, it requires thematic um, expertise, but also operational expertise when it comes to making sure students get into the arts, putting together an incredible lecture series. I think of it as you kind of are running a three ring circus. Um, and we got incredibly lucky when professors Lee Rayford and Lauren Croys stepped up to the plate and agreed to put together this version of the course. Lauren Croix's research focuses on modern art in and exchange with the United States. She's particularly interested in theories of modernism and avant-gardism, in the history and theory of photography, in race and representation, art education, and more. She's the author of many articles um, that have appeared in numbers of places, but is known in particular now for her book, Creative Composites, Modernism, Race, and the Stieglitz Circle. Um, and is also now working on a forthcoming book studying the ways regionalist education projects linked art and citizenship in the United States during the 30s and 40s. Lee Rayford's research focuses on race and visual culture in the broadest and rangiest sense. She's the author of numerous publications, but I'll flag a couple. Her book, Imprisoned in a Luminous Glare, Photography and the African-American Freedom Struggle. She's also the co-editor of two incredibly important collections, one, Migrating the Black Body, Visual Culture and the African Diaspora, as well as the Civil Rights Movement in American Memory. Her work has appeared in numerous academic journals, edited collections, art magazines, and news outlets. If you have seen the lineup for this series, uh, the lineup of speakers, um, you know already <laughs> that all of us are in the debt of these two professors, um, in their debt for the service and incredible provo provocation they are providing for our campus with this series. So I want to actually ask before um, you, uh, both Lauren and Lee to stand for just a minute so that you can help me thank them for all that they're doing for our campus. Amen. And I'll now ask Lauren to come to the stage and launch her series. Thank you, Shannon. So Lee Rayford and I, as you've heard, have organized an outstanding series for our A&D sponsored Big Ideas course, LNS 25, Public Art and Belonging. In considering public art and belonging, we recognize that this class takes place on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Ohlone, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. We acknowledge and pay respect to Ohlone ancestors, peoples today, and the Ohlone future to come. This lecture series explores relationships between art and belonging with a focus on race. More art might remind us of forgotten, excluded, and devalued contributions of marginalized people to our rich history. Or we ask, is public art merely a way to manage multiculturalism and silence dissent? How would Berkeley look if art and design were used to create spaces of care for relationships of justice and equity? We ask you to come back every Thursday and join a range of artists and thinkers to investigate how publics might be represented by, formulated through, or critiqued in artworks. As you know, all talks are free to the public and begin around 1210 in this theater. You can find more information on the BAM PFA website. I was gonna read you everybody, but let's skip right to who you're here for today, which is Paul Farber. We're gonna kick it all off today. I'm gonna highlight, 
I'm going to highlight Paul's achievements. I skip a bunch of stuff. I'm delighted to welcome the amazing Philadelphia-based curator, historian, and educator, Paul M. Farber. Among his many titles, Paul's the artistic director and co-founder of Monument Lab and senior research scholar at the Center for Public Art and Space at the University of Pennsylvania Stuart Weitzman School of Design. This morning, Paul talked to my Berlin studio class, so he's already given a talk today, about his new book, A Wall of Our Own, An American History of the Berlin Wall, which is coming out from the University of North Carolina Press this year in a few months. That book grows out of Paul's dissertation and PhD in American culture from the University of Michigan. And I mentioned this work, which Paul won't actually be talking about here, because it's how I first encountered him and his work through his writing. I read his 2013 dissertation in 2017 when I arrived in Berlin as a visiting professor. And in that document, now a book, he weaves together the untold stories of how, as he puts it, a group of American artists and writers who found refuge along the Berlin Wall and in Cold War Germany in order to confront political divisions back home in the United States. I enjoy reading all dissertations, of course, but being in Berlin, especially through a winter, wasn't easy for me. And Paul's book taught me so much about what other Americans I admire tremendously, including, including Angela Davis and Audre Lorde, what they'd learned and done in Berlin. It's an account that's transnational, but also deeply local. And I'll hazard that's also what characterizes his approach to monuments and makes it so moving to me as well. And that work with monuments is what he'll actually talk about today. In 2012, Paul co-founded Monument Lab, an independent public art and history studio based in Philadelphia along with Ken Lum. Their work emerged from university teaching, and by 2015, they'd installed outdoor classrooms in the courtyard of Philadelphia City Hall. Since then, Monument Lab has worked with artists, students, activists, municipal agencies, and cultural institutions on exploratory approaches to public engagement and collective memory. Monument Lab just published a beautiful book, Monument Lab, Creative Speculations for Philadelphia, and students in LNS 25 read excerpts from that book, and we've got 10 copies that Paul's willing to sign at the end. Paul's done many other extremely impressive things, including curate a 2014 exhibition of work by our Berkeley Arts Practice colleague, Stephanie Sajuko. But by now, you probably would like to actually hear from him. So please join me in welcoming Paul Farber. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Um, it is really uh, a treat and honor to kick off um, this fantastic series. Um, and before I begin, I want to, of course, thank our hosts here at Bamfa and um, Professor Shannon Jackson, um, and especially to Lauren Croyes and, and Lee Rayford um, for this um, really uh, inspiring opportunity to be here with you. Um, I'm going to be speaking about Monument Lab um, on behalf of a group of artists, curators, um, critical thinkers, librarian, um, and hopefully to give um, some perspective on this moment that we're living in, a moment of reinvention and reckoning around monuments. Um, now we have a book, uh, Monument Lab, Creative Speculations for Philadelphia, and the hope is that this is a record of some of our past work, but also um, a living handbook. Uh, maybe even think about it as a kind of recipe book for what kind of approaches that our artists, our community organizations, and uh, critical thinkers are using to confront legacies of injustice uh, in our monumental landscape. And, you know, at this point, we operate as a studio and doing projects in the United States and now um, some other partner projects outside of U.S. borders. Um, oftentimes thinking about what it means to critically engage the monuments we've inherited and to unearth the next generation of monuments. And now when I travel, I think about in some cities, of course, what monuments are there to um, respect local knowledge and expertise. And increasingly when I travel the United States, 
I'm able to find, depending on the city I go to, uh, a kind of unintentional monument to this moment of reinvention. Um, last year, uh, we installed a show in Memphis, and here is the former site of a monument to Jefferson Davis. It was installed originally in 1964, and it was uh, taken down by the city in 2017. In Baltimore, a site of a former statue to Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, installed in 1948 and taken down in 2017. And in each of these sites and a handful of others, generally here is what I sense as um, the kind of uh, historical arc. For at least a generation, um, there's a group of activists and organizers who have called attention to legacies of racism, of sexism, of homophobia, of xenophobia in public squares. And in the most recent years, political leaders in a city seeking to respond, if we're lucky, move in fast and take the monument away, but do so often under the cover of night without acknowledging the work of activists and organizers and without an attempt to understand what happens, of course, um, when you remove a, a contentious symbol, the groundwork that's necessary to remediate. And I use the term remediate, um, acknowledging and calling to our practitioners and environmental design and work who, um, when you know there's legacies of, of toxicity at a given site, you don't just rebuild over it. You really seek to figure out what it means to remove that. And we think about toxicity in terms of legacies of racism um, and other kinds of, of, of hatred, what it takes. And each of these sites, as far as I know, they're blank spaces. The stories of struggle are not recognized. And this question, this moment of suspension that we're in continues. Yesterday when I arrived into town, went down to the Pioneer Monument, which um, is right in front of City Hall. And um, as, as many of you know, you know, the statue that was dedicated first in 1894, it was moved to a new location in the mid-90s. Um, and in 2018, after um, much ad advocacy and organizing, um, especially from um, uh, indigenous activists, the city removed a, a, a really um, problemat problematic and hateful symbol um, involving a, a caricature depiction of a Native American um, from this plinth that reads the early days. And in going, uh, you know, I'm here for, for just a brief visit. Others here may have different perspectives, but seeing this um, piece of machinery suspended over um, as if there's an uh, action about to take place, and of course, um, there's nothing going on there. It's in this moment of pause. Um, I would love to know where the statue is held, like many of the others that are um, now being deaccessioned or kind of withdrawn from public space. But what do we make of this empty plinth, especially one that's inscribed early days? We have in inherited a history, if we read our monuments, that is a small sliver of the living history of the living memory of a given place. And that place may be a neighborhood, a city, a country, or beyond. Um, but this notion of what the early days were, where the early days were measured, and how that connects to legacies of injustice um, is important. In Monument Lab, what we're trying to do is think about that connections between systems and symbols. There is not harmless kinds of history. History can be utilized as a force of connection and collectivity, but also as a kind of blunt instrument against the very people who um, have been marginalized in a given place. So I think about these examples, and there are countless others that we may look to um, that are emblems of our time. We know that we have to make a change. We know that the change has to happen in really dramatic, sweeping, and public ways. But more so than not, that change is kind of run through channels of bureaucracy. And we expect different outcomes without changing our process. And to have a different process, one where process matters as much as outcome, one where we take into consideration this as not a new conversation, but one that we've been inheriting from people in past generations and in recent years, we're able to think about public art and belonging in a different way. Monument Lab is one approach 
and we see ourselves as a public art and history studio, but also as part of a network of artists, scholars, organizers, memory workers that are thinking about approaches to process and outcome in our public art landscape. And our work takes on the form of prototype monuments, like this one from a collaboration with the artist Sharon Hayes um, uh, in 2017 in Philadelphia, monuments that are not meant to be permanent, but instead to kind of meet people where they are in public spaces and provoke reflection on this idea of a quote unquote permanent piece of public art. We do participatory research where we meet with uh, people in public, we pay students and educators to have conversations face to face about monuments and collect um, data sets. Sometimes that data, those data sets are messy, but the idea is to have fingerprints left on them of the people whose ideas and complex attitudes um, emerge from the way that they traffic and navigate a city. And these two approaches have brought us from being a classroom project to a passion project to now being a studio that's able to operate. And, and I want to be very clear, Monument Lab is in some ways um, informed by um, a kind of approach to the study of monuments that some may say is social scientific because we like to collect data, but it's as much social science as it is public and performance art. We try to meet people where they are to think about ways to approach monuments that value anti-racist, decolonial, feminist, queer, ecological perspectives to public memory and public history and to continue conversations with an invitation in to really understand the long arc of the work that it's going to take to build out our public spaces. This is a story that could potentially have been um, kind of birthed in, in any number of locations, but the place where we started in Philadelphia is important. And um, for those who are familiar with Philadelphia or not, I start with this statue um, on top of our city hall. For colleagues and friends from uh, California who've seen a statue on top of a building, um, who have a different kind of awareness of landscape, they say this is um, nightmarish to imagine. But um, you know, for, for us, this is a, a statue of the so-called founder of Philadelphia, um, English Quaker William Penn. It's a statue that was put on top of City Hall at the turn of the 20th century. It faces the site of the uh, treaty that uh, William Penn was said to have agreed, agree, agreed to with the Lenape people, um, and that uh, William Penn's sons um, and colleagues uh, undid in a series of um, fraudulent land thefts that resulted in the formation of, of much of the uh, eastern side of the state of Pennsylvania. And William Penn also marked the tallest point in the city that anyone could build for um, uh, decades um, and by a, a kind of informal agreement. If you took away William Penn's image um, and the story of the treaty that people have, have great pride in in the city, you'd see a lot of negative space. The holding on to this sense of purpose from that original treaty and not the stories of its unraveling is really part of this also notion of the early days of Philadelphia. Um, another statue that perpetuates, um, or at least lives in myth, is a statue to the boxer Rocky. Um, I say this is the statue of the most famous Philadelphian who never lived. Um, Rocky, you know, is a, a film, uh, a character from film, um, and is powerful in a sense because um, no matter what day uh, or time of year, there are people lined up to take a picture next to Rocky, um, and um, in some ways it's. Um, you know, looked at in the city as kind of strange and accepted. Um, but it was, it was the, for me, a really pivotal moment was um, having um, young activists from A Long Walk Home, a black feminist uh, art organization in Chicago that I, uh, on which I served on their board, when their young activists came to the city to talk about their role um, in contesting um, the kind of hashtag Me Too movement, one of the first things they wanted to do was run up the art museum steps and raise their hands like Rocky. And so just thinking about the complex way in the city that we treat monuments, um, of course, the real boxer, African-American uh, boxer Joe Frazier, had a statue dedicated to him in 2015 
not in the center of our city, but down by the corporate owned Xfinity Live by the stadiums. And the contrast between a mythic white Philadelphian who stands in for the kind of gritty everyday person and the real life boxer is an important dynamic to bring up. Um, and then, um, you know, to nod to uh, P. Diddy, all about the Benjamins. There's a lot of Benjamin Franklins all over the city. There are dozens of Benjamin Franklin statues. And when you take into consideration of the bus, of the abstract renderings, of the ghost architecture, of the scholarship programs, of the parkway, of just the north side of City Hall alone that has three likenesses of Ben Franklin, you get a sense that there's an attachment to the early days. And I think it's important to note the kind of reckoning that has been going on, including um, at the campus at which I teach, the University of Pennsylvania, a group of historians and students under the name Penn and Slavery Project have pointed out that Benjamin Franklin was an enslaver. The Benjamin Franklin later in his life became an abolitionist, but earlier on had printed um, fugitive slave ads in the Pennsylvania Gazette. What do we do with both of those histories? One approach has been to say nothing. And I think increasingly, as we know, how do you speak this reckoning out loud? What kind of changes will it bring to the public art landscape? There are all kinds of ways that we can already point to, but I think bringing that process to light is important. And I, I bring here, you know, in this country, we don't have a national monument or memorial to enslavement and to those who are enslaved um, on the National Mall. In Philadelphia, right by Independence Hall, we do have the President's House, dedicated in 2010. It is a site of the first presidential residence and therefore the site of the per first presidential slave quarters, where um, President George Washington and Martha Washington strategically moved um, their uh, people who they enslaved out of Pennsylvania right before a six month cutoff that would have emancipated them. Um, and this is right next to the Liberty Bell. And um, it wasn't always there, it was a buried site and it was the work of historians and organizers that said, we don't need to tell the story of freedom and repression separately. We actually gotta bring them together as part of our public memory. This is the backdrop for Monument Lab. Um, and again, we started asking these questions about who gets represented, who's doing the representing, how did we inherit our public art? Um, myself and Ken Lum were co-founders, but it was really our students and our colleagues that pushed this practice. In a, in a way, we were interested in Philadelphia and the fact that for a city that has over 1,500 historic sculptures, um, when we started this work, there were two to women who actually lived. Joan of Arc is one of them. She's not a famous Philadelphian, but we appreciate a statue to Joan of Arc. Um, and one to the Bostonian Quaker, uh, Mary Dyer, both who are martyrs. Um, there is now, as of 2017, one full figure sculpture to a person of color who actually lived on public ground. That's the 19th century freedom fighter, fighter Octavius Cato. And you could point to, of course, the Joe Fraser statue by the stadium or some kind of partial bus um, around the city. But most of those other sculptures had to be fundraised and now maintained by private groups. And in comparison, if you count that one or two or handful, you see this in profound discrepancy and inequity. It's the uh, monuments we've inherited from people who thought there was a democratic vision of history. But it's important to note when we kind of look away from marble and bronze, in the city of Philadelphia, there are 4,000 murals, many of which depict grassroots struggle, um, people of color, feminist, queer figures that don't depict history as a single figure looking off into the distance, but instead what it means to look at history from a neighborhood level. If you add historic markers, house museums, parades, poetry, and you take a look that's more not just vertical but horizontal, we're not waiting for monument ideas to emerge. Monuments have been living in different ways. That's why we change our definition of a monument to be a statement of power and presence in public. A statement of power and presence in public. And if you have the time and the money and the power to build a monument that's important to you, you will. If you don't have the time, money, and power, you gather around a monument that exists to amplify your presence and make your voice heard. This was the first project that we did um, with the late artist Terry Adkins in the courtyard of City Hall. We decided that we didn't have answers, we didn't have a thesis about what the new monument should be, this was 2015, but we said we could ask a question to as many people as we could. That question 
was what is an appropriate monument for the current city of Philadelphia? In each of our projects, we try to have a question that doesn't have one answer, but has a multitude of possibilities to build coherence, but also push out what is expected in a city's public space. Terry's answer was an empty classroom. He said that in the city of Philadelphia, which is known for educational institutions and figures, after a 2012 wave of closures of public schools, um, often in neighborhoods that were um, more, pr uh, more predominantly uh, for marginalized communities and uh, lower income communities and communities of color, said we're now known for our school closures. He wanted a monument in the middle of City Hall, not a monument because it was permanent or universal, but because it cut right to the way that the past, the present, and future converge. It was inspired by a classroom in Philadelphia, the first one where teachers were trained to teach. And he said, I want it to be critical, but it's not negative. It's meant to invite possibility. It's not a plinth that no one can reach, but instead a platform that people are meant to sit in and think about what it means to impart our visions and values on the future. A different kind of classroom went right alongside of that, our monument lab. We used a shipping container. We hired our students, a public historian, and a social worker. And we asked that question to as many people as we could. We used a paper form as a way to gather our data. Technology would be on the back end when we would count and transcribe and kind of uh, open up that information to other people, and we were blown away. I thought I would write the description and kind of go a few times to train my students and look at it from afar and write about it. And every day I got pulled in. And it didn't matter if you had a PhD or you were from Philly your whole life, when people came up, the number one question they asked was, what's this? I said it in this beautiful, defiant, skeptical Philadelphia way with that posture to match. And you'd say what you were doing. Right? You give an invitation in. And oftentimes, people would like let down their guard and be like, oh, OK, cool, I get it. And there were two kinds of interactions that we got. One was, um, hey, I've had an idea for a monument for 10 years, and no one's ever asked me, can I tell it to you? And they take our clipboard and our pen, and they just go and write it. And they take a minute or an hour, and they would add to it. Other people were like, cool, 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 I get it. I don't want a statue. That's not what's going to work for me. But let me tell you what's happening on my street. And at this time, this was before Charlottesville, before um, New Orleans, before a number of cities had been reckoning with their monuments, but activists had been pushing, especially Black Lives Matter activists, the Occupy movement. Monument was a way to talk about past, present, and future together. That show changed my perspective. I spent far more time in public projects. Um, I spent more time thinking about how to learn from colleagues who were in the field of monuments and those who were not, people who carried with them a sense of history as a living force. We were able to partner with Mural Arts Philadelphia, 10 municipal agencies, and get an opportunity that was rare to have the resources to do a citywide exhibition in the Phil Philadelphia area, to invite 20 artists, to have 10 sites, uh, two museum spaces, but also work with community organizations for several years. And to think about the center of the city that goes back to those early days, to the colonial founding, but also neighborhood parks far outside of the downtown radius to understand from people who utilize parks what it means to build and imagine a monument. When we asked the artists, we got an amazing array of answers. The artist Mel Chin said he wanted to make a monument that was accessible to anybody. He built two plinths. It was called a monument to me because there were two me's, too much me to you, um, but if you see it from above, there were 90 feet of ADA accessible ramp behind them. And anyone could rise to monumental status, but the caveat is that someone else could too, right across from you. And what's your interaction with them? Do you share the space? Do you compete? The interactions across them, the shouting matches, the words of love between them and down below created this amazing platform, not just a spectacle, to think about what it means to you be a monument or be monumental. The artist Tanya Bergera proposed a monument that in some ways was traditional. It was figural, it was elevated. But for Tanya's sake, she called this the monument to the new immigrant. And she wanted it to not have an identifiable race or gender or ethnicity. She wanted to think about populations who weren't legacy immigrant groups, who had monuments and memorials to them, and their um, therefore place in the city was more precarious. And she wanted to make it with unfired clay that would fall apart day by day. 
And over time, when the steel armature below would be revealed, there would be another waiting to replace it. And she wanted to make a monument to renewal as well as to loss. What is lost in the process of becoming and what is possible? I would see people come by every day, text me a picture. Oh my gosh, this one piece fell off. And just the um, call to pause, to not produce, to not have an outcome, to not have a solution, I think was one of the greatest gifts. And it channeled what a lot of the artists and members of the public we talked to. They wanted monuments that were present, but they also wanted to deal with absence and loss in our public space. Karen Olivier covered a Revolutionary War monument in the neighborhood of Germantown with a mirror. We asked how monuments reflect us today, and she said, all right, let's ask that question in an embodied way. In a neighborhood that was once colonial, that George Washington's summer home is up the street, and George Washington lost a battle in the Revolutionary War, and there's a monument to it. She covered it in a, with a mirror in a neighborhood that's now largely African-American and working class. And this was a, a sculpture that she tried to deal with what was already in the park. She was out there for several weeks during installation, talking with and debating people about, well, should a monument go here? And people said like, oh, well, what's under that? Um, we don't need that monument. And she said, um, come back and see how people interact. We had a plan for vandalism. And Karen said, you know what, let's just see how it goes. The, the sculpture was never vandalized. In fact, it had a, a self-appointed um, conservator who would clean it once a week. And as a curator, at first, you're like, oh my gosh, what material are they using? You gotta let that fall away. Because sometimes public art is not just public art, it's public symbol, it's public platform. It is transcending what it means to um, call something art because it has to be a part of the greater landscape. Of course, all public art is in conversation with all other kinds of public building. Um, when you have a museum, you have the value of the building. When someone walks into it, they opt in, and they're like looking at something in the gallery, and they're like, okay, I can see. In public, people walk past, or you compete. Your project starts the moment you start building. And Karen, so beautifully and so powerfully, took that into consideration. And Karen, though this is temporary, said the work really started when the monument was returned back. And we had to think about this as one of the hundreds of things that we've inherited from the past that we wonder about what it says about us today. Caitlin Pomerantz wanted to make a monument to the building boom of the city that resulted in the massive change of neighborhood structure and architecture. So she created a monument to the stoop, the front, the front steps, um, but she wanted to call attention to the forces of um, development that were often redoing our sense of public space. And so she brought pieces of stoops from homes that were being demolished just in the six months before the opening of the show and put it in Washington Square Park, which is right next to the Liberty Bell and it's National Park Service run and is a potter's field. And it created this ghost street where everyone would come and sit and read their books or sit for lunch with no house behind them. And um, again, because process matters as much as outcome, we worked with the masonry union um, worked with the salvage community, and we're waiting for the, um, the mortar to dry, to open it the next day, turn on the local news, and there's a reporter sitting on the stoop reporting live. And just this idea of a monument that isn't what's on top of the pedestal, but the pedestal itself, seeing what people did with the space was remarkable. And um, the talk of the town, um, Hank Willis Thomas's uh, monumental Afro pick, um, which is now in the collection of the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, um, some of the work that we did was very important to have an architectural meeting ground where people would connect and it was built with community organizations over the course of years. Hank's idea was more like a lightning bolt, to put it in the city, to put it right there, close enough to our contentious statue of um, former Mayor Frank Rizzo, um, who, who was a police um, chief and then mayor and kind of known for his brutal approaches to um, policing communities of color, around gay liberation and the feminist movement. And we tried to troll that statue. It wasn't right next to it. It wasn't uh, as a way to recenter it. It wasn't far, uh, but it was close enough that you knew that it had something to say to it. And this also um, you know, became an editorial cartoon in which showing the Afropic larger kind of encasing Rizzo um, and became a way 
all early on when it went in to, to be a place of belonging. We know if you study public art that uh, over time, bronze sculptures where people touch often, the patina on it, you can tell where there's contact from the oil and skin. Anytime I would go to this site, you see the fingerprints on this. And if you followed that to Instagram, you would see that all times of day and night, multi-generational, multi-racial groups would have pictures there. But of course, in a city that has so few representations of black life, of black power, of um, black solidarity and resistance, this was important. And um, also this, as Hank termed it, um, was uh, his Afro Oldenburg. There was a Cla Klaus Oldenburg sculpture very close to this of the everyday object of the clothespin. And Hank is so adept at pushing us to think about what's possible in public. Not every artwork was a sculpture. The artist Michelle Angela Ortiz projected images of detained immigrant mothers uh, from a facility outside of Philadelphia onto the city hall facade uh, for the project Seguimos Caminando. And she worked with the Shutdown Burks Coalition, a group of activists, to stage performances during the exhibition um, when the governor and other uh, public officials would be there to draw attention to that facility right outside of Philadelphia. Um, and this was you know, already a moment of crisis around the border, um, but it was Michelle's work that, for me, pushed me to think about what it means to have an immigrant family prison right outside of a city that claims itself as the birthplace of democracy. Clip Collective created a monument to the Philadelphia families of South Philly, um, those who came in um, uh, the moment where the port was open in Philadelphia, um, but also to African-American migrants um, who were studied in W.E.B. Du Bois's uh, sociological work, The Philadelphia Negro, to new refugee and immigrant communities from Bhutan, Burma, and Nepal, and to create a light sculpture for one night that people would gather and walk through. Um, and finally, um, let's see if this will play sound. It might not. Um, you can find the sound online, but the artist Emeka Ogba partnered with Ursula Rucker to create a solar-powered listening station uh, in, in the city and a, another installation on top of the library to play an epic poem that you could plug into at any moment, um, at least with the plugs we have in 2017. But the idea that a monument could be large, could be looming, and some of our artists took that path, opened up space for the ephemeral, the poetic. We had augmented reality scavenger hunts and performance pieces, and it wasn't about finding the perfect monument, but instead flooding the city's imagination with possibilities. It was about gathering in public spaces, talking with artists involved in the show and others engaged here, Hank Willis Thomas, um, Tariq Trotter, also known as Black Thought, and the scholar Salome Shatillet in the courtyard of City Hall. And then of course our labs, because next to every prototype monument was a learning lab. We paid artist educators and high school students to be our researchers and our students from the university got credit to work during the semester and be researchers as well and that was, uh, strategic and purposeful. And there were 10 of these sites around the city. And the project was as much a kind of biennial style approach as a participatory research project. And yet again, we were blown away by what we collected. We engaged 250,000 people in person and about 4,500 of those people left their own monument proposals. Reading those proposals is like reading a collectively authored book about the city that is haunting, that's beautiful, that's impractical, as much as it is a handbook of possibilities for how to think about monuments. Some of them, like this, when you linger on them because they're powerful as a data set, but each one of them carries its own amount of information, meant to be enough information for someone to claim authorship and identity, but to loosen the burden of a long political or, or public process. This one also blew us away. Um, the idea next to a kind of highly publicly invested piece of public art, the Philadelphia High Line, I know every city has one that they claim, um, but this was to utilize that abandoned infrastructure uh, to create a platform for William Still, the abolitionist who collected stories of uh, those who were formerly enslaved once they got to Philadelphia, in part to connect them with their families. There's a new collection of 
uh, William Still's stories that he's gathered with a forward from Tanahisi Coates. And to us, this was as important as any idea for like what to do with this public square. Because this is about the values, the visions, the possibilities of art and history. As much as we worked outside, we worked inside. Partnerships with the library, digital humanities labs. That is something a university can do for the purposes of the public. We transcribed, we analyzed, we made a website that you could search by keyword, by age, by neighborhood, by form. And what's beautiful about using paper to gather insight is that people broke our approach all the time. They'd write in the margins. We'd ask your age. They'd say too old. They'd answer with a partner, and they'd um, average their ages. We'd say, where do you want to put your monument? Name a place, intersection, or location. And they'd say, in front of every police station. right? Or they would um, give their own map of the city and kind of break that apart. And, and as all you know, if you've ever had to fill out a form online and it doesn't quite fit, the, uh, your answers don't quite fit, you turn around and you have nowhere to go. And this allowed for the step of, of mediation and possibility. We gathered this into a report to the city in Philadelphia. And we gave it to the mayor's office and all the city commissioners. We put it in all of the public art, I'm sorry, the public offices, so any municipal office in every free library branch. And I want to be really clear, no one asked for this report. But the moment you say a report is coming, people are like, when's the report? I, I would love to see that report. Mayor's chief of staff, when is that report coming? City Hall Public Art Office. You know, I think about um, the words of, of Audre Lorde, black feminist, lesbian poet, among other distinctions, and paraphrasing her, that the rumor that you can't take on City Hall was started by City Hall. And what we found is, of course, moments of pushback, but more so allegiances, possibility. It was the report to the city that shared some observations that everybody knew, but didn't have data to point to, that we need more representation of non-white male straight military people in our public spaces. Um, but we also need to think about the way that People are seeking connection. We saw so many proposals to people holding hands in public, oftentimes of many races together. And when we read it, we're like, this is not a kind of monument that exists. And some of them we read as tokenizing or um, kind of erasing difference. But there were nuances in there. There were ways that power relations were mapped and legacies of division were in there. And, and I think there were all kinds of other patterns, and especially the idea that the outcome of what an appropriate monument would be was not disconnected to the process of power. Sometimes what the request was for a monument was for those in power to listen better and more fully to those who have been calling for change for, for generations. That was as important. Our report to the city of Philadelphia blew us away in part because it seemed applicable and was used as a tool of outreach to people in other cities. Our exhibition opened in September of 2017, just three weeks after the tragic events in Charlottesville when white supremacists um, stormed the city and resulted in the you know, terror of, of anti-racist activists and the murder of um, anti-racist protester Heather Heyer, but also other cities like New Orleans and Baltimore where people were removing monuments. And, our goal by the end of that exhibition was to unfreeze the monuments. And all of a sudden, three weeks before the exhibition, a lot of people were like, we're ready. Let's talk about it. And there were some people who came to us. I will say in general, they were um, generally white, generally of privilege, who were like, wow, monuments are so relevant. I'm ready to talk about them. What a moment. Aren't you excited? And you know, our tactic, because we work in institutions and our approach is to invite those people in to meet them where they are, but to not erase the fact that that was not the first time that we were ready to talk about monuments. The conversation didn't start. It wasn't convenient. Instead, it was a great responsibility to be able to honor longstanding or at least attempt to honor longstanding approaches and figures and stories that um, this was the right time. This was an opportune time because the time is always now. You know, the time is urgent, and also the time is one of reflection that stretches across. Um, we connected with really important colleagues like Paper Monuments from New Orleans, Sue Mobley and Brian Lee, A Long Walk Home in Chicago, Scheherazade Tillett and Salamisha Tillett and others, and started to realize that we had to, on one hand, 
balance the respect, uh, the knowledge of local expertise and local stories, but what happens when you build strategy across locations? We were authorizing each other to be able to step up and offer possibilities and long-term approaches um, to making monuments. It shifted our work. We went from being a passion project to being a studio. People would call us in the days after the exhibition. We're like tired and like putting everything away and figuring out what to do. And some of those calls were too foolish to follow up on because they were like, oh, can you do something tomorrow um, for no money? Um, and can you call your artists and leverage all these people who work together to do something? And then we would have to say no. And then the other side, there would be calls that were like, wow, this is a responsibility and powerful. Could you talk to a public art office in a city that has removed Confederate monuments and does not know what to do? What happens when someone calls and say, hey, I utilize your approach, and this is what I'm doing in my city? And so instead to have this kind of evolving, really a socially engaged art project that took on the form of being a studio and organization, to be able to know what we could not do, but what we were signing up to do. And it's really changed what's possible for our work. And as I close, just to give you a glimpse into some of the things we've done since 2017, we started a transnational Monument Lab Fellows program. Um, and of course, one of our inaugural fellows is Berkeley's own Cheyenne Concepcion, whose Borderlands Archive um, is an amazing project about thinking about the US-Mexico border wall as a monument in all kinds of ways and take on white supremacy um, and legacies of colonialism. Um, also in a strange twist of fate, thanks to the German government, we've been able to expand this year's cohort to all of North America, um, including the Caribbean, and uh, we'll have our next announcement of fellows um, in March. Um, and we have an annual gathering for those fellows in Philadelphia that you're all invited to in June called Town Hall. And I've seen the applications, and it's stunning. And it's people who are building new monuments, but also having us think about land use, public space, and belonging profoundly. We partnered with Salome Shatillet in New Arts Justice in Newark for the project A Call to Peace in Military Park, which um, is known for a statue by Gudson Borglum, who is known for Mount Rushmore and uh, the white supremacist Confederate monument in Stone Mountain and worked with artists, including Jamel Shabazz, on this installation facing the monument of black veterans in Newark. And this is, will result in a longer project in Newark, also utilizing that same monument lab method of prototype monuments and research. Um, and we partnered with the Pulitzer Foundation in St. Louis um, on a project mapping monuments. And uh, we, they had an exhibition about monuments in ancient Egypt that had been removed uh, or um, kind of, you know, de-sphinxed, as, uh, you know, as we'd say, like, were altered as a form of power, and they asked us to make it relevant. And in a city that had a Confederate monument taken down also in the middle of the night, um, but also has an arch that is its greatest point of pride, its most recognizable symbol, but is a monument to Western expansion that uh, is a shadow over the stories of indigenous people, um, of violence, of, of displacement. And it was important for us to think about how to approach this. And what we did was hired local so sociologists and poets, often people who actually occupied both of those roles, um, and had them not in one site in public space, but move around 46 different sites, including the, the museum underneath the arch. And they asked people how they would map the monuments of St. Louis. We did this over two months, and we collected 750 maps. Um, we also left blank space. We asked people to explain. We wanted to think about this relationship between space um, and monument, which hopefully feeds into this notion around belonging. Um, I will tell you that, in part, our motivation was seeing if we could make the arch disappear. Um, I think like a little bit of sleight of hand, like David Copperfield, um, but at least as a kind of provocation for ourselves. But when we asked people, of course, the arch was the most common um, mo or most, most cited site. Um, fewer than half of the respondents included the arch on their map. And when they did include the arch, if they included other sites like the racial uprisings in Ferguson or sites of police brutality, um, there was also people who made their own legends to their maps. Like here is one like, Monuments that need love, 
because and and that's kind of critical love, um, real engagement, and other monuments also that need attention because they've been functioning in public as telling a fuller story. We're blown away by these different kinds. Some again are humorous. Some um, are fat, are you know befuddling. And this is an, a project that we're now starting to think about in other cities and at different scales. What does it mean to map the monuments of the city as a way not just to figure out what is there, but figure out what's not there. We also turn this into data that you could splice and dice in any number of ways. We asked people to identify themselves. We felt like we didn't want to create a form that felt like the census um, that would delimit people, but opened it up. And 38% of map makers identified themselves um, which we felt like it was important to acknowledge this as a choice, um, to identify oneself. And then finally, one in 10 of the sites was actually no longer there in the physical realm. It was erased or demolished. And one in 10 of the sites was a potential site. When you see the monuments of a city from this perspective, the places that are erased or demolished, or the potential or imaginary, you get a different possibility of what is necessary in order to build places of belonging in a city. <clears throat> These are remarkable artifacts, they're data. We've been working with Washington University to um, have their students in sociology and African-American studies utilize this data as the way they're training their students, but also to have feedback and doing a series of community stakeholder meetings that will result in the making of a map and a presentation. Um, I wanna close here because I think um, on one hand, this shows that there's, the work continues. Once a monument comes down, or even before that, there's so much reflection that has to happen. There's also so much possibility that already exists from those in the field. And I wanna end also with an invitation. As we heard from our opening that this is a time here at Berkeley or in the Bay Area where we're rethinking what is the kind of public art that doesn't make the same mistakes of the past or attempts to heal or gather together? How, of course, do we work together across locations or across lines of division to take on the legacies of the past that continue to harm, especially around racism and sexism, xenophobia? Um, but also, how do we make our process different so that our process yields different possibilities, some that are urgent, and some that will last us as powerful forms of reflection. Thank you. If you have questions, we have ushers on the ends that have microphones. Just raise your hand and please wait for one before starting. in LNS 25, thank you, I don't know if it's myself, um, that we thought um, were pretty awesome, and I can read them, or you can read them yourself. Um, so the first question is from Noah Finch. Noah? Where's Noah? Would you, would you like to read your question? Uh, you can all read your question. Uh, <laughs> Noah, read your damn question. <laughs> uh, I think it's like um, public art price is right. <laughs> we're coming back to you. Thank you. Um, so my question was in regards to historical context when considering public art. Um, obviously for people of color and for marginalized communities, their historical context is different than ours. You know, they may see things in a much different manner because they experienced history differently. Um, and I'm just wondering, when you're considering whether or not a, a piece of public art is appropriate, whether it should remain standing, do you think it's appropriate to consider it from a modern perspective or to utilize some historical context um, or a, a mixture of the two? Yeah. Thank you for your question. I actually want to invite some, I don't know, reflection even on the we or the them. 
Sure, yeah. Yeah, and so I'd say also, even just for me personally, I'm a, a white Jewish queer curator working with a multiracial group of people as anti-racist, and we are often trying to think about uh, a variety of, of necessary things to deal with in public. I think one of them is how to engage histories, but to not work a wound, to not um, at the wrong times and in an aggressive way without a lot of consultation, without a lot of um, seating the, the front, so to speak, um, to understand how to not immediately go to a, a, a kind of trigger or trauma is one. Two, um, I, I think that, you know, one of the ways for us, because we work with artists, is to trust an artist to take into consideration a number of those kind of points that you bring up. Um, there actually is no one appropriate way that works, um, but I would argue that the monuments largely that we've inherited, again, are really reflective of people in power who were invested in a particular symbol. And you can read that often even in the plaques themselves and how who is thanked and who is acknowledged. Um, and so instead of working a wound, how do you build a community of healing and understanding and reflection where a piece of artwork that's meant to provoke can also have around it an investment, including of financial resources, for people to be able to talk who are trained in either mediation um, or in other kinds of forms of engagement? And then also, how do you think about cutting out this idea of a zero-sum game between um, often put out to people who are trying to transform monuments and monumental landscape of like, keep all the monuments up or tear them all down. Which one do you choose? Right? And instead, there's so many ways that people have and continue to shift the way that we think about monuments. Oftentimes, it's giving, again, to artists, to, to community organizers, to students, a space to experiment that allows for new possibilities. And there's not one right answer. Some places, a sign that rewords and reinterprets what someone is seeing in public is really an effective tool. But I would argue you kind of, this is the same of political organizing. I want to actually hear from the people who are impacted most by the ongoing legacies of injustice related to a monument to ask them if it needs to be removed and taken down, if it needs a certain process of remediating. And start there before coming up with a one-size-fits-all approach. Thank you. Do you have a question? Um, okay. <laughs> um, where is Jay Bala? Um, so my question had to do more with like uh, the artist behind the monument um, as opposed, like the artist as a symbol as opposed to the actual monument itself as a symbol. So I said, uh, or my question is, do you believe a monument or art piece should be allowed to exist publicly um, if there are moral or ethical controversies about and surrounding the artist who created the piece? So for example, if the artist made controversial statements um, about like delicate issues like white supremacy or, or various other issues, uh, whether, whether like how that should be approached and uh, like f for that monument, the artist that created that monument. Yeah, well, this is a debate that goes beyond the boundaries of public art. Okay, can you separate an author from their life um, and appreciate their work? And and it's it's so particular to any given kind of debate. There are times there are some people that we um, as a culture I can't take their artwork in our kind of public settings or public culture, I would say paying attention to the debates about the given topic, the given site, is incredibly important. One that I mentioned here is in Newark, New Jersey, but it could apply to any number of sites. It's Gudson Borglum, who is the, you know, found the, the sculptor behind Mount Rushmore um, and Confederate Stone Mountain. And, you know, I think Borglum was... Um, very closely aligned with the Ku Klux Klan, and also said that his um, goal was 
um, you know, to, to think about national healing. He had a son named Lincoln. Uh, Noguchi, the, the famous Japanese-American sculptor, was his assistant. And of course, he dismissed him and said he'd never be popular. And then Noguchi rose to, to prominence. And this is a figure whose history is being debated in Newark, New Jersey today. And of course, if you extend that out to um, South Dakota, where Mount Rushmore is, and the questions of um, what it means to have Mount Rushmore within a contested space with the Crazy Horse Monument also being built um, just down the road. I think I've heard a number of approaches, and I don't want to um, overtake it with a, a single answer. I've heard people say, and I really reason with them, that the symbols got to go. This was a card-carrying <coughs> member of the Ku Klux Klan, and wow, like how could this exist in downtown Newark today? Um, and I've heard other people, and I, I think you know them as, as anti-racist or, or other kinds of social justice folks who are like, no, I need this here as a way, as a, as a tool, as a teaching tool to say this was seen as banal and neutral for so long. Um, and I, I believe both are actually right. Um, it, I, and so I'm actually very ambivalent about what to do in that regard. And again, I turn to the people who live closest to it, who also think about the resources that are put into protecting these symbols of the past and maintaining them. Every monument would um, be covered in debris if it wasn't for the ongoing maintenance budget that's put behind them. That's where it's not just about the past, it's about the present. So ask questions like the one you're asking. Who was the artist? Who were they connected to? Who were the supporters of this monument? How does that then give us a chance to have a, a more holistic approach to figure out what to do with that monument? People who aren't in our class want to ask any questions. Part of, part of the same topic that you're talking about, I'm wondering about in, in your studio's process, if you grapple with the question of who a monument belongs to and how you try to answer that question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think part of what we try to do is shed light on the process of belonging. And when you say it, I think of ownership and stewardship as part of that. But also, of course, those ownership and stewardship are two separate things. Ownership can be stewardship in the sense like you're in charge of it. If there's flowers or lawn in front of it, you have to mow the lawn. You have to make sure the light bulb on the light that casts upward is changed. Um, but ownership is also about public symbols and about what you feel connected to or what you feel a right to gather around or see as part of, of yourself. Um, and I would say what we try to do is shed light on the fact of like, well, if we're talking about a monument that exi has existed somewhere for a long time, how do we amplify the story of how it was put there as part of a reckoning around what to do with it? Like, who was the person who paid for it? At what points was it debated? Um, at what points were additions made to it? At what points are public resources drawn to that um, space? When we work with an artist who's making a prototype monument, Sometimes they're trying to do it in relationship or in conversation with another existing monument, but other times it's about a public space that also has questions about how resources and narratives of belonging are coming up. So if anything, we're interested in seeing more conversation about not just the monument as a, as a kind of period at the end of a sentence that speaks for itself, but instead a series of conversations that stretch back and go forward um, around well, what is ownership? Who has a right to speak for public space? And again, how do you make a process where those considerations are coming up? And something we're seeing and hearing from like municipal partners that we talk with, for a long time they have accepted art from people who've gifted it to the city, wealthy benefactors, without necessarily a long-term plan of like how that fits into their mission. Um, maybe those are people that can afford a maintenance budget as well, so they'll accept it. And then after the fact, the city's like, wait, wait, do we accept monuments of living people? Or do we accept monuments of people who died within 10 years of the formation? Wait a second, what happens if we realize this person's story includes 
legacies and connections to white supremacy, what's the approach? And we hear from municipal art officers often that they're like going back now making those distinctions about belonging as around ownership. So I think that that's a real opportunity to make a connection about belonging that's about feeling like you can claim a space that you're in or spend time in, sometimes against patterns of exclusion and belonging as like, wait, I have a right to this. I'm, I'm a, a student or faculty or staff member of this campus or I'm a resident of the city. This is as much my say as anyone who has defined what is appropriate for generations. We're gonna do two more questions. Okay, anybody not in our class? Going once, going twice, okay. Okay, this is from someone who's D. Catente, I believe last name back there okay so my question was for um, us as students we are awful um, interested in the process of choosing these artists for um, the um, lab, the, okay. the process that you yeah. took to choose the artists for the lab? Got it. So in, <clears throat> in an exhibition, um, there are times where you have a single artist, and you kind of try to think about the artist as someone who's going to collaborate with you, who's going to open up possibility. A lot of the work that we do is with multiple artists. And I think there's a few considerations that we've tried to have when multiple artists are involved. One is to think about the demographics of a place and to have an artist roster that matches that, um, or at least aspires to, around age, race, gender, sexuality, class, national belonging. One of our approaches has also been to try to have at least half of the artists who will participate from that place, or at least have lived in that place, and be okay with the half or 49% being from somewhere else as a way to um, open up a little bit of exchange. What you find is that people have deep connections to a number of different places, like Hank Willis Thomas is not um, a Philadelphia-based artist, but actually grew up partially in Philadelphia. His mother, Dr. Deborah Willis, um, you know, was as a, as a North Philly native. Hans Hacke was an artist that we worked with, spent years in Philadelphia. You realize that the crossings of many people give them uh, first or second uh, hand connection. Um, and then finally, we wanted the artists to create room for not just other artists, but uh, public participants to push out the possibility of what a monument is. So we knew that we wanted people who used history as a living force, who of course are dealing with archives and public spaces, but is a kind of um, mathematics as a, as a curator that you come up with. All right, if we have three to five large sculptures that people's heads will crane up to, it will create room for 10 pieces that you look at eye to eye, and then another set of, of works that are ephemeral that you can't find unless you go through these other kind of um, ways toward performance or toward projection or toward poetry. And to think about those ephemeral pieces are as important as the sculptural ones, but they make room for each other. And therefore, the end result is an attempt to say any one of these is a powerful tool for engaging history. How would you utilize this set of tools, or how would you come up with your own? How do you feel like you don't just have to inherit a status quo, but thinking of artists as helping you to break apart the status quo toward many possibilities? Last question. Do we have any more? <laughs> we got any more? All right. We're wrapping it early, unless anybody has a question. OK, everybody who asked a question, you are entitled to a copy 
of Monument Lab. I was gonna, we were gonna sell books, but selling things is very hard, so we're just gonna give them away. Anybody else can buy this any place that books are sold. You won't be able to get Paul to sign it, so if that's important to you, come up and make your case. Okay. You can send by post-it note. You, yeah. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. It's cop again. And, and folks, before, before you get out of here, I would say, first of all, keep in contact with us. You can reach us at monument underscore lab on the socials. Um, but also, our work evolves over time. And who knows, maybe something in your class or things you're doing here, connecting on new ways in the future will we'll come forward. And thank you so much. And come next week to hear Jeff Chang. <laughs>